Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sonia Khan and I welcome you back to this Educational Theoretical Perspectives lecture series. Previously in my lectures, I discussed four generations of sociocultural activity theory, starting from Vygotskyan concepts to Lenatev's to Engelstrom's activity theory. Vygotsky's work was concerned with micro-teaching and learning processes. It failed to address how institutions or organizations regulate or shape the thinking of individuals who work within them. Engelstrom's theory relates to interactions within or between activity systems. It failed to address how discourse is constructed. In this lecture, I will discuss Bernstein's social theory or pedagogic discourse, which addresses the two gaps that I just mentioned through the concepts of recontextualization, classification, framing, and vertical and horizontal discourses. Bernstein's work in schools focuses on two levels, structural and interactional. Structural level refers to social division of labor, while interactional level refers to the social relations it creates. Social division of labor can be analyzed through the strength of the boundary of its divisions. For example, in schools, you have the head teacher, teacher and pupils, or even middle managers in between. And interactional level refers to pedagogic context, that is the social relations in the classroom. Before we try to understand or draw connections between structural and interactional levels, I think it's important to understand the three message systems in schools. And these are curriculum, pedagogy, and evaluation. Curriculum refers to legitimized knowledge. Pedagogy refers to pedagogic context of teacher and taught. It regulates the legitimized transmission of knowledge. And evaluation refers to valid realization of that knowledge by the acquirer. Now the big question is, how is knowledge legitimized in order to be valid for transmission and realization? This is what Bernstein refers to, the process of recontextualization. And that answers several questions. At first level, the question is, who owns knowledge? At this stage, knowledge is owned by intellectual communities, for example, universities. And at this level, knowledge is context-free and abstract. Then is the second question, what is taught and how it is taught? It is here where state creates a curriculum and guidelines based on its ideologies and sends that to the schools, who they also give some relative autonomy to create their own curriculum, but that has to be under the guidelines provided to them. So at next stage, what school do is, they provide the curriculum to the teachers. But along with that, they give to teachers their own visions and aims, their theory of instruction, which states what good teaching should look like. So they do transmit some of their ideologies to the teachers. So you see how thinking or knowledge is recontextualized and how thinking is regulated. I will show you one example towards the end of this lecture and that would help you make sense of what I'm speaking here. So let's come back to the two levels that I was referring to earlier in the lecture, the structural and interactional levels. Bernstein uses the concept of classification to determine the underlying principles of social divisions of labor and the concept of framing to analyze or to determine the principles of social relations. The aim here is to integrate the structural and interactional levels of analysis. So classification refers to the boundary strength between what is classified at structural level, whereas framing refers to a message system of pedagogy, or one can say how interactions that takes place in a social relation will be regulated, and the degree of control that teachers, students, or parents have over selection or sequence of materials received. It might involve, for example, instructional context, instructional practice, or regulative practice. Again, I'll give you an example and that would help you form a better understanding of these concepts. 
Bernstein then further moved from his theory of construction of pedagogic discourse to an analysis of discourses and thus provides greater differentiation between everyday and scientific forms as identified by Vygotsky. Bernstein describes horizontal discourse as common knowledge which is accessed by all but segmentally differentiated, implying that contradictions might arise across contexts. Vertical discourse, he states, is hierarchically organized. It has strong distributive rules that regulates access, transmission and evaluation. So let's take an example of two teachers, teacher one and teacher two, teaching in two different schools, school one, school two. I have taken this example from my own uh, research on uh, teaching and learning situations in Oxfordshire schools in, in the UK. And uh, so let's just discuss that based on the concepts that I shared with you. At inst institutional level, two schools had different theories of instruction. School one wanted teachers to include opportunities for students to discuss learning create space during the lessons for the students to discuss in pairs or groups and participate in open discussions. It wanted students to enjoy and investigate the subject content and think a lot rather than take a passive role. School 2's philosophy uh, was that teachers should put the systems and structures in place. So as a result of these two theories of instructions, you see how instructional practice and regulative practice for both the teachers was different. So for school one, teacher focused more on assessment. She started and ended her lessons with multiple choice quiz that would help her understand where the students were in their, less in, in their learning and would also help students reflect and evaluate their progress over time. And to help students enjoy and investigate the subject and think a lot, she created tasks that would allow students to enter into a different physical reality. For example, sometimes they would become pilots and see where on which runway their plane has to be landed. Sometimes they would become elite force within the defense forces and try to send message across to the other teams or based on mathematical problems that they had to solve. To be able to assess and to help students work in groups or pairs, use general seating arrangement where students were seated in rows and they could turn around to talk to their peers and even now uh, teacher could move up and down the rows and read students seated in the middle as well. For teacher two, the main aim was to put the systems and structures in place and that actually kind of regulated the way teacher uh, introduced subject content to the students. So whichever subject content they were studying, students were introduced to a success criteria. For example, three categories, A, B and C. And according to their ability, according to their understanding of their capabilities and where they wanted to reach in their GCSEs, um, what grade they would want to reach in the GCSEs, they decided they would decide in every lesson which category they would work towards. So say for example, a student um, thinks he would want to work towards category B. So there are certain things in that category that he or she has to meet. And so teacher would help that student reach that level. So if you see um, in school two, where the structures were highly valued, there existed a strict hierarchy. Teachers were required to follow the guidelines set by the department and higher management, whether they were working collaboratively or when, when, when teaching individually in the classrooms. Whereas for teachers in school A, though there was strict hierarchy in terms of uh, um, head of the department and rest of the teachers, it wasn't so strict to follow certain structures. They were not handed down with sheets and task sheets that they had to use to introduce to their students as well. So I've used Bernstein's theory of classification, framing and vertical discourse here to help you understand the connection between macro level institutional analysis and micro level interpersonal analysis. So according to Bernstein, institutions themselves are cultural artifacts and have the power to control and regulate individual thinking. 
And that is what we even saw in these two examples, how theory of instruction shaped teachers' thinking, who further shaped how teaching and learning would take place in the classroom. With this, I conclude this lecture and hope to see you soon again. Thank you.